There are seasons of life that I can remember where I was asking for God to help me. And I was in the midst of some situation where something was hard or I felt like I was just over my head and what was going on around me. And I remember praying to God every day as I was in that situation where it felt like I just didn't have enough to get by, whether it was enough energy or enough health or enough wisdom. And I kept praying. And every day I asked the Lord to do something. But there seemed to be no change. There seemed to be no divine deliverance. And then one day, perhaps many days later, after I started praying, I'd have this realization. I'd be like, huh, I made it to today. I made it to this point thus far. God gave me what I needed every day. And it wasn't some large change or divine deliverance from maybe the health problem I was facing or the financial problem that I was facing or the relationship problem I was facing. But God's constant presence and his constant provision was there for me every day as I needed it. And I almost missed that God had helped me. I almost missed that God had helped me because it didn't come how or when I wanted it to come. Sort of a deep thought, but let that marinate for a moment as we look to the scriptures. As many other believers live with unresolved or difficult circumstances, and it could be their finances or their health, their relationships, anxiety, the stress of life, things that we've prayed about, things we've asked God to resolve in our lives, and it still hasn't happened yet. You're in the midst of it still. And it can cause us to doubt God's faithfulness or his commitment to us or even his love for us. And what are we supposed to do when God doesn't fix it? God is, in those circumstances, still providing. We're just not looking for it in the right place. So we're going to rejoin David this evening as we study and learn from David's path to the throne as he and his men are in these days in the wilderness where they are dodging many attempts left and right from King Saul as he tries to kill David over whom he is so jealous. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 23 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 23, beginning in verse number 1. The word of God says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their castle and smote them with a great slaughter, excuse me, their cattle. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Abimelech, fled to David, to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah, and to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he forbore to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness, in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood. And strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of, my, of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. 
and that also Saul, my father, knoweth. And the two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Let's pray together. Father, as we enter into your presence with thanksgiving, as we read your word, we ask that you would open it to us, that you'd give us ears to hear, that you would take this passage and the truths of it, and that you might help us to understand, that you might make our paths plain to know what we ought to do with it. In Jesus' name, amen. David was anointed king, but he was not on the throne yet. From his time as a young boy, God's prophet came and singled him out and said, you will be the next king because the old king has sinned and God has rejected him. Now, sadly, David is not on the throne at this point and the old king still is. And the old king became so jealous of David and David's success that David had to flee for his life. And after some initial terrible decisions and how he would flee, God had led him to a cave and into this wilderness in this area where he then for years lived like Robin Hood, that legend of old, as somewhat of a criminal being chased by the king, but also doing good. And we come to chapter 23 and verse number one, and it says, and then they told David saying, behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah and they rob the threshing floors. David was in a, a mountain rocky fortress inside of this area called Adullam, the cave of Adullam. And the area outside of it was known as Ziph. And they were, they were held up in this area that was hard to live in, but also really hard for Saul to find them. But they heard that the Philistines, the enemies of God's people, the children of Israel, that they had come out and that they were now attacking the city of Keilah, which is the city of Israel, and that they were trying to steal all of the food. And they were robbing of them of their cattle, their livestock, and also all of their harvest. They're robbing the threshing floors. And that would mean a terrible winter and probably many people in starvation. You say, why did this even come to David's attention? Because King Saul was not doing what he ought to have done. If he was the right kind of king doing the right thing, he would have been interested in his borders being invaded. He would have been interested in his cities being taken over and his citizens robbed. But he was a very selfish and self-interested king, especially at this time. And so it finally came to David, David, will you do something about it? Verse two, therefore David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. He asks God, that's always a good thing to do, isn't it? In a situation where you don't know exactly what you ought to be doing, Asking the Lord is a very good plan. I love this type of David's decision-making rather than what he did when he first fled from Saul. When he first fled from Saul, it was all fear and the flesh. And he just did whatever popped into his mind and he didn't really stop and ask what the Lord wanted. But one of the priests survived Saul's slaughter of the city of priests. His name was Abiathar. And he was there and he went on David's behalf before the Lord in that role of being the priest and asked, what should we do? And the Lord said, you need to go and smite the Philistines. Now that sounds a little bit like a risky endeavor because this wasn't a normal military unit that was with David. They were sort of a little bit of the dregs of society. They were some good people, but also some of the people that were just unhappy. It didn't make them great soldiers and they didn't have great funding and they weren't collecting taxes and they didn't have a lot of experience in this, but there were people that were in need and when he asked the Lord, the Lord said, you need to go and you need to, to save the city and the inhabitants of Keilah. Verse three, David's men said unto him, behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? He says, you want us to leave our fortresses. We're, we're running for our lives and hiding in these rocky crags and inside of these caves and in this, in this wilderness. We're here and we're already scared. You want us to go and expose ourselves out into the open and you want us to fight the Philistines when Saul and his army could come upon us at any time? What if while we're fighting the Philistines, Saul comes at our backs? He's gonna find out where we are. He can't find us where we are right now, but he will if we go out there. And so what does David do? It says in verse four, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. I love that David is the type of leader that listens 
to his men, but God had already given him an answer. God had already told him what it was he was supposed to do. And perhaps David was affected by the fear of his men. Perhaps his men thought we needed some more assurance. I also love that God is merciful because instead of God saying, why is it that you didn't listen the first time? God confirms it and adds a little promise onto the end of it. Verse four, and then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. He says, go and do it. And I'm going to give you victory. Just in case you were a little bit worried before that it wasn't going to work out, I am going to be with you and I will be the one that gives you victory. So if your men are worried about not being enough, that's not really what we're measuring here. It's whether or not God is enough. Verse five, so David goes. David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. It's one thing to know what God wants you to do. It's one thing to believe that God will meet you there. And it's yet another thing to actually go and do it. There are times when we want to know what God wants us to do. But if it's not exactly what we want to do, sometimes we will take that knowledge and do nothing with it. But instead of just doing whatever he wanted, he heard and then he led his men. This is one of the reasons why they needed leaders that why David was made a captain over these men, because David had great faith in God, and some of these men would become mighty men in God's hand. But right now, they weren't quite there yet. And so David goes, and he listens to what it is he's told to do, and he does have this victory, and they do get their livestock back. They do get the harvest back that was taken. And the Philistines are, they use the word again, a great slaughter. It's a very vivid word, isn't it? A slaughter. I want you to take note of something here, just in case you've, you've heard some things that are untrue. God, the God of the Old Testament, the same God of the New Testament, God the Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, here gave one of his servants an answer saying, go, enter into martial conflict, and I will give you victory over the enemy. There is a time when violence is the appropriate thing. Now, notice this isn't David going and beating up somebody he doesn't like. This is not David going and murdering somebody that angered him. This is one nation doing battle with another nation that they have declared war on each other about. The Philistines invaded and they were taking the things that belonged to the Israelites, which was going to cause them to starve. Certainly, the people of Keilah put up a fight. Some of them most likely died. And so this was a combat situation that they were entering into. There is a strange notion that people have come up with that somehow God is against all sorts of confrontation and violence. Now, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We know that's true. He doesn't seek out that the wicked might die. He wants them rather to repent that they might come to faith in him. But there are consequences and there are things that need to be done. And we do see here that God himself is the one not just David coming out on his own, but God himself sets David on this course to do what needs to be done. In fact, God said he would add his blessing to it. And so they recover what's been stolen and David saves the day. Verse number six, and it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. So Abiathar comes and he meets up with them in that city that he might perform the role of the priest so that if David needs to go to God the Father, he can go through the right ceremonies. And everything that they feared that would happen does happen. Saul finds out that they're exposed. Saul finds out that they are out of their caves and out of their hiding places. Verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. What happened in this city is that it was a walled city. It was a city where if you were inside of it and somebody guarded the gates, you wouldn't be able to just get out. When David and his men were out in the wilderness and Saul tried to bring his troops against them, they would melt into the land. They would all just leave. They would go into the wilderness where it would be hard for them to be found. The troops wouldn't have the supply lines necessary to chase them around all the wilderness of Ziph. They wouldn't have everything that they need to go into these caves. Plus, they were fortified positions. They turned them into little fortresses made of the rock and the stone of the area. So it wasn't an easy thing to do to chase after them. But 
Saul says, we got him in a city. And if we can siege him, and we can put all of our troops around the city, then David can't get away, and finally he'll be done. And he says it the weirdest way that you would imagine Saul saying it, God did this. Anybody think that God actually did this, like God was doing things for Saul at this point? Saul had just murdered 85 pro uh, priests from the city of Nob. He had just killed the whole city. It says that he sent his servant to kill every man, woman, boy, girl, even the animals of the city of the priests of God. You think God's doing anything for Saul at this point? Saul is delusional as to what side he is on here. And he says here, well, God did this for me. As we'll see, the Lord is going to protect David. In verse number eight, and Saul called all the people together to go to war, to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Saul couldn't be bothered with Keilah when they were being attacked by the Philistines. Anybody notice that? Saul couldn't be bothered to call the nation to war. He couldn't gather everybody together when his own nation was being attacked by their national enemy. But when it was in his own self-interest, when he could get rid of the usurper that somehow he thought Jonathan had poisoned against him, Saul made up all sorts of stuff that wasn't accurate. Because of the space that he was in, he had to blame all of his problems on other people because he wouldn't take ownership over his own problems. And he said, I'm willing to go to war and call everybody up in order to go. See, right in modern day, we have a standing military, which means that there are men and women in barracks, on bases, in our country, overseas, where we have zones of stability, where in a moment's notice, you could say, hey, deploy. There's combat. In this day, they didn't have just a bunch of people sitting around doing nothing. What would happen is they would call them up. And you would leave your fields and you'd leave your animals and you'd leave your families and you'd go and you'd get your spear and you'd get whatever armor you had on and you'd go and you would answer the call to battle and then we'd all go to battle. And when that was done, you'd go back to your livelihood. So he mobilized the country to do this because he said, we're going to besiege David and his men inside the city. Verse 9, and David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring hither the ephod. Saul tried to call everybody up, but David heard about it. David still had friends in the military. David still had friends around. And so when Saul was trying to be sneaky to get everybody to come, David knew what was going on. And he said, Abiathar, it's time for you to go to the Lord on my behalf. Verse 11, will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? And Saul come down as the servant hath heard. O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. He gets confirmation that this is going to happen. Verse 12, then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. David once again goes to God instead of just going with his gut reaction, right? Instead of saying, we've got walls, we've got gates, we've got men here. I've led people in battles that we shouldn't have won. I've got the blessing of God. Saul most assuredly doesn't. Let's go ahead and make a fight of it. We could take this as an opportunity to deal a great blow against Saul and his armies. But instead of just deciding to do whatever he wanted to do, he went to the Lord and he said, God, is this, is this going to happen? Is Saul going to come down? Absolutely, Saul's going to come down. And are the people of Keilah going to give me up? And he said, yes, they will. That's, that's sort of sad, isn't it? Because what did David just do? He just saved them. They were going to starve that winter, but David shows up and brings them back all of the harvest. And David shows up and rescues all of their livestock. And he defeats all of the enemies that attack them. And there he is inside of their city now where they are hosting him. But God says, here's what's going to happen. If Saul gets there, he's going to put his troops all around and he's not going to let any food come into the city. And he's not going to let anyone leave the city. He's going to use his military to make sure that happens. And the people of Keilah will begin to starve. And they will choose, David, their selves and their families over their loyalty to you. And they will toss you guys out on your ear and let Saul get you. Well, David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbear to go forth. 
So they find out the 600 of men that are now with David, up from 400, they decide that they have to leave. And so they just melt away back into the landscape rather than staying. And when Saul heard that David was no longer there, he thought, well, there's no point in chasing him to Keilah. And so he forbear or he withheld going forth. Verse 14, and David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. Every day, Saul's agents were hunting him through the woods and through the rocks. And every day, God delivered David from Saul's hands. Now, if Saul, excuse me, if David could look at the problem with Saul, what might David choose? I think David would want this to be over. How many of you think that David would be done living in caves? Done being a fugitive when he didn't do anything wrong. How many of you think that's what David would want? I think that's what David would want. You know what would be really convenient, Lord? What if Saul had some sort of, I don't know, coronary incident. And he just tipped off that throne that he doesn't deserve to be on anymore. Wouldn't be any less than he deserves after all of the people that he had slaughtered that were your men. Wouldn't be any worse than all the children he had killed in that city because he was petty and vengeful. Uh, it wouldn't be any worse. Yeah, why don't, why don't that? And then, instead of me running around the wilderness for what's going to amount to about 10 years of his life, why don't I just get to be on the throne? <laughs> Why don't I get to be uh, lifted up like you said I was going to be to be the king? That seems like a much better solution. But here's what God did for David. God provided for him, but it wasn't what David probably wanted. Every day he was chased, every day he got away. Every day he was chased and every day he got away. And it says that it was God that made sure that happened. God made sure that Saul could not get his hands on David. There is no power, there is no government that can stand up to the power of God. Doesn't matter what they can bring, doesn't matter the modern day technology, they cannot do a thing if God is against them. And so here God is against Saul, he can't put his hands on David. This was how God provided for David in this moment, though it perhaps was not exactly what he wanted. In verse number 15, it says, And David saw that Saul was come to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Verse 16, and Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David into the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Saul is seeking, David is hiding, David and his men are living this outlaw life, and then Jonathan comes. Jonathan leaves where he's at, finds out where David's at. Isn't that interesting? Jonathan could find David. Saul couldn't. Jonathan could find David, but Saul could not. Because Jonathan was come there in order to strengthen his hand. Jonathan was taking great risk to himself by doing that. He was Saul's son. And perhaps not everybody that was aligned with David was as merciful as David was or had the friendship with Jonathan or thought of Jonathan. This is Saul's son. Why don't we take him out? And yet Jonathan is willing to risk not only David's men attacking him, but also his own father's wrath. But David needed some help. We don't know the exact moment that this happened or what preceded it. But Jonathan's message to David in verse number, let's look together, in verse number 17. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. His phrase is, fear not, in the beginning. David was a man like you and I. He, he is a person. And though he has moments of great faith, he also had moments of great weakness. And here, apparently, God sent Jonathan there to strengthen his hands. What does it mean to strengthen somebody's hands in the Lord? Did Jonathan come with a bunch of extra troops for David? Did Jonathan come with a bunch of weapons? Did he come with bags of money so that David might buy himself soldiers and armor? No, he came and he strengthened his hand. How do, how do you strengthen somebody's hand? What you said is true. He pointed him to the Lord. He continued to point him to the Lord over and over and over again. And he said, you have nothing to be afraid because God is on your side. David's looking around at the cave that he's living in. And he's like, yeah, God's on my side. Listen, David, don't you be afraid. God is protecting you. Fear not. The hand of Saul is not going to find you. My father's not going to get you. You are going to be king, as God has promised, and I will support you the whole way. I'll be right behind you. 
And he says, Saul knows that this is true, and that's why he's fighting so hard. That's why he's so fearful. He knows that if God keeps working, that God's going to put you on the throne, which is why he's determined to kill you. He kept pointing David to the Lord for everything that he needed. And in verse 18, it says, And the two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. What's a covenant? It's a very serious type of promise. You say, what kind of promise did they make? Well, similar to the promise that David and Jonathan had made before, that Jonathan recognized that David would be king and that Jonathan would support David as he went to the throne. That they would be friends, that they would be loyal, that they'd have each other's backs. And when the day came, Jonathan, though to be king by bloodline, he would step aside so that David could become the person that God wanted him to be, the king of Israel, that he would sit on the throne. And so even though they knew these things and they'd made this promise before, they reaffirmed it. It doesn't make it any less special. Sometimes we need to hear the things that we already know and have heard before because in that moment, we need to be reminded of them. If we take all of this, these incidents and we try and draw some conclusions from it, what does that response look like? First of all, we should ask God for guidance. We should ask God for guidance. David consistently, through this passage, asked the Lord for guidance over a number of things. What should I do? Where should I go? Is this the right path? Instead of proceeding by the flesh and just the counsel of what others said, he went to God and wanted to know what God had to say. David's men were scared, and they responded like scared men. They're like, this is a bad plan. Going up? to this city that's all exposed, going to, to, to Kila out there is a terrible plan. We ought not put ourselves at risk. And the flesh might have said, you know what, this really isn't even our problem. I'm not the king of Israel yet, obviously. I live in a cave. Why are you coming to me with the trouble that these Israelites are having? Let their king deliver them. Let their king fight off the Philistines. Why should I do that? You could understand if it was just his flesh, but he asked what God wanted him to do in this situation. Even if it didn't seem to be the easy call or make the most sense, that's what God said to do, and then David went and did it. We ought to ask God what we ought to do. We ought to be the same kind of people. We ought to pray. Praise God, you don't need to find an ephod somewhere. You don't need to find a linen priestly garment for somebody to put on and to go and offer ceremonial sacrifices on your behalf to find out what it is that God wants you to do. You have, through the high priest of the Lord Jesus Christ, direct access to the throne room of God. You can, in this moment, in any place around the world, bow the knee before the God of heaven and have his ear. You can do that. I can do that. The question is, will we do that? Do we do that? Most people make decisions like this. I've run into a problem. What is the first thing that I can do that seems to be all right? Let me do that. And then they just keep muddling on through. That seems to be the way that most people make decisions. They don't necessarily gather all the facts and find out everything that they ought to do and analyze these decisions. They just kind of find something that seems okay and they go through with it. But the people of God ought to ask what the Lord wants them to do because sometimes he will tell us to do things that common sense or gut reaction would not tell us to do. And yet God is going to do something great through it. So how do we do that? We ought to pray. We ought to ask God to show us. And we ought to expect him to answer. We ought to wait until he does answer. It's very weird to sit there silently before the Lord. We want to do most of the talking when we pray. It seems like a strange thing, and we think, well, God's probably not going to say anything back, so let me just talk a little bit more, and then once I'm done praying, I'll get up and go do whatever I was going to do anyway, but at least I can say, I prayed about it. But God does answer. God answers through his word. Have you ever been looking for direction, and then God brought you a message through his word? Oh, it doesn't say, Bill. Don't buy that truck. You know, Second Opinions, chapter 3, verse 12, right? That, that's not what happened. But I have at times been reading God's word for myself, and I'll see something that, that directly uh, uh, 
it has to do with, it's connected with the situation I'm in it, right now. It tells me what I need. And I thought, well, that's not a coincidence, is it? Or I'll go to the church meeting and the pastor will preach something and I'll be like, have you been listening into what's going on at my house? How do you know? I, I remember times when God spoke to me that it was, if I didn't believe in the Holy Spirit beforehand, I certainly did afterwards. Because there's no way that God could have known in the passage that the preacher used, there were just these things. And I said, wow, I got my answer now. There are other times as, as I prayed and I was in my holiest of moments, we might say, in those holy moments where we're praying and we're worshiping the Lord and we feel very connected to him, when our flesh is quieted and the spirit is loud, those desires that God gives you in your heart as to what we ought to do or not do, or the godly counsel that we might seek from other people or circumstances, God does indeed answer. You said, well, I've asked the Lord before and I haven't heard anything back yet then the answer is wait. The answer is wait. Patch the pirate. If it's doubtful, don't do it. Take time to pray and think through it. It's a little children's song, but it's great advice. If God hasn't moved you, then don't move yet. It'd be better to wait for a sure answer from the Lord than to rush ahead. I know that there are times when waiting too long can be bad, but I think we'd all be willing to agree that when we rushed ahead is when we made more mistakes than when we held back. Ask God for guidance. God will make it clear, and if it's not clear yet, wait. Second of all, be satisfied with God's provision. Be satisfied with God's provision. God protected David from Saul, but he did so while he still lived in caves and in the wilderness. Saul did not catch him. David did not starve. But he also wasn't in a comfortable living situation. You know what seems better, God? If you would just take Saul, as we mentioned before, get him off the throne, put David back on the throne, that seems a much better way to deal with this problem. However, that's not how God chose to provide for David for that season. It was in these years that God made David into a king. It was in these years of hardship that he took his heart and continued to mold it until he would be the kind of king that God wanted him to be. And we cannot shortchange that process. It's not how he hoped, but it's what God had given him. So let's say you have a financial problem. You know what sounds good to me? Full bank account. Full bank account that can handle all of the bills as they come in and all of the bills that you didn't know were going to come in. That sounds much better than our daily bread. We're meaning God gives you what you need as you need it. I really like the full bank account method but it doesn't teach you the faith that daily bread does, nor does it necessarily come with the promise that God said he would give us our daily bread. You know, complete healing when I have a health problem sounds a whole lot better to me than strength to endure illness. But sometimes God's provision is strength to endure illness. Restoration of a broken relationship, everybody apologizing and everybody asking for forgiveness and everybody being willing to own up to what they've done sounds much better to me than for God to give me his peace in brokenness. I'd much rather have the problem done away with. We need to learn to trust that God knows best. And we might miss out. We might miss out that God has been providing the whole time because the problem hasn't gone away. God's answer might be to bring us through it instead of to take us out of it. So let's trust and be satisfied with God's provision. And then let's strengthen others in the Lord. Jonathan could not change this situation directly. He didn't have the wherewithal in order to topple Saul from the throne. He did not have the military might in order to help David. He didn't have the weapons and funding or couldn't get it to him safely. But what he did was he went and he spent time with him. He showed up. And that means a lot if you've ever been in the place when you needed somebody to show up. How many of you have ever been there? You needed somebody to show up and God sent somebody. Isn't that wonderful when God does that? The Lord brings somebody along. One of the things that they talk about in the chaplain training for the police department is what's called a ministry of presence. You show up as a chaplain in the worst moments of people's lives. It's like take all the things that are awful about being a pastor and then just go do those things. Death notifications, 
hospital situations, terrible wrecks where you're sitting there watching the fire department or the EMS try and cut your loved one out of a wreck and you're just a wreck yourself as you wait to find out what happens. All of the hard things that you get called to do in the past, that, that's what the chaplains do. And they say sometimes, oftentimes, you don't know what to say, you don't know what to do. They, they had a little motto, if you can't improve on silence, then don't try. Just be there. Just sit with them. Just be present. Jonathan went from his nice house and went into the woods to find him. And it says that he strengthened his hand. He kept pointing him to God and encouraging him, reminding the things. Did David know that he was going to end up as king? Well, David was there when he was anointed. He felt the oil run over his head when the prophet Samuel said, you will be the next king. Has he seen God deliver him again and again from Saul? Yeah, he should know that God's not going to let him go, not going to let Saul get his hands on him. Jonathan has already promised before that he would be behind David all the way through. You'll be on the throne, and I'll be your right-hand man. I'll be right there for you. He knew all of these things, but he needed to hear them again. Sometimes we, as people that know God's word, and we know the truths of God's word, get in these spots where we need to have somebody else say them to us. We may have even gone to other people when they were hurting and said those promises and reminded them of those truths to others when they were hurting, but when it's our turn to hurt and it's our turn to fear, we need someone to come and to strengthen our hands in the Lord so that we keep looking back at God because there's a lot of distractions and other things to look at other than the Lord. Oftentimes, we have loved ones that are in hard situations and we can't fix it. We can't change the situation that they're in. We, we wish we could, especially with our loved ones. Nothing earthly we can do. However, we can point them to the Lord who can change their situation or who can sustain them through their trouble. How do we point people to God? Well, we remind them of his goodness. We remind them of his character. We remind them of his promises. We remind them of his track record. He has quite the track record. And we pray for them. We pray with them. Even, like I said, even if they've heard it all before, say it again. Even if they've heard it all before, say it again. Because sometimes we just need to be reminded. Ask God for guidance. Be satisfied with God's provision. And strengthen others in the Lord. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee. And thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knoweth. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment as we have what we call a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that God has spoken to you about. Tonight, if you're here and you don't know Christ as Savior, I want you to know that to have the God that David had, the one that kept him from his enemies, to have the God that provided for him when it seemed no one could, to have the God who gave him guidance when he needed it, all of that begins with the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to the Father through the Son. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And so if you don't yet have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's where we have to begin tonight. God became a man without ceasing to be God. And he lived on this earth, a sinless life, and he showed us who God the Father was. And then at the time that was right, he laid down his life on the cross to die for our sins. And then the Lord Jesus, three days later, rose again from the grave. And if you've never believed on his death and resurrection for your sins, if you've never called on him as Savior, I want to encourage you to do that tonight. That's where all of this begins. But for those of us that know Christ as Savior, let's ask a few questions to help us know how to apply these things to us. When was the last time you asked God for guidance? I'm sure you've made many decisions, but when was the last time that we asked God for guidance? I want you to know he does answer. He most assuredly answers. But we have to come to him first. Is that a habit that you have? Are you satisfied with where the Lord has you right now? Even if the situation hasn't been solved? Even if the situation is grievous? You say, I don't know how I can make it another day. Well, he brought you to the close of this day, didn't he? 
And you're going to wake up and you're going to find that his mercies are new tomorrow, that his compassions, they never fail. You're going to find him right there waiting for you next morning. And he'll see you all the way through to the evening. God is faithful. I love it when God just removes the problem and delivers us miraculously. I love it when he takes a, a little boy and gives him a stone and a sling and slays a giant and sends the armies running. I love those moments. We've seen them in David's life. But there's many moments, like the wilderness of Ziph and the cave of Adullam, where every day God provides for us. Let us not miss his hand and think that he doesn't love us as he provides for us in that way in this season. Do you know somebody that needs to be strengthened in the Lord? Just with everybody's head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around, just between you and me and God, you say, I know somebody whose hands, he probably, she probably needs their hands strengthened in the Lord. Would you slip your hand up? You say, I know somebody right now that's going through it. Amen. God sees your hands. And he knows the person on your heart. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Would you pray for them tonight? And then would you seek this week to go to them? to try and encourage them. Maybe they don't even live in this part of the world, so maybe you're going to have to make a phone call or write a note or a card or a letter. But would you take it as a, a mission from God himself to go to them and point them back to him? Oh, you say, they know all of that. Yeah, but they might need to hear it again. They might need to hear it again. Strengthen their hands. Maybe you've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism and you want to get that process started. Or, or maybe you just need someone to pray with you about something completely different than what we spoke about tonight. Whatever it is, would you say yes in your own hearts before the Lord in this hour? Father, please take your word by thy spirit and make us more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.